All right, so let me start again. Um, to remind you, every week the post has to have eight things on it. For each goddess, it ha has examples of two women whose life stories fit that goddess. One is somebody you know, one is somebody in the public eye, plus two works of art. One, they can be either about that kind of woman or written by that kind of woman. And then you explain why you think so. Um, all right. I will try to put that on the announcement, you know, in the class, in the classwork, but at least now I've got it on the recording. Um, there are a lot of students who have not handed them all in, um, but there are a lot of students who've got serious issues. They have internet issues, they're sick, their kid is sick, their mother's sick, their grandpa's sick, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff, so you don't get graded down. Um, I don't think anybody's being lazy. <laughs> I trust you. Um, I do, I will have to hand in midterm grades at a certain point. And so I'm going to have to grade on what I have. So if it matters to you or not, how that grade comes out. Um, and here's how the class is going to go. We have Persephone today. We have Hestia on Wednesday morning, Tuesday night. Then the following week, a week from today, we have the conclusion. And then you have your first formal paper is due a week after that. I will post that assignment soon, sometime probably after Wednesday morning, your time. Um, and I want it, I'm gonna grade it harder than usual because it's gonna to have to be more formal with a thesis statement and paragraphs. And, um, you know, it's a writing seminar. So the post is more like just associating the ideas with people's lives, right? It's it's applying it to life. These three formal papers are academic exercises. So I, it's a writing seminar. You need to learn to write English well to have a, a good career at this particular point in history. I think there are injustices about that. It's hegemony. It's a, a way for colonialism to persist but you can't fight it, right? This is a, this is a fight you don't need to try and um, engage in. You need to learn English. Um, also, I'm tutoring some first graders in reading and it is crazy how so many words do not look like they sound. And those poor little kids have learned uh, a is ah, uh, oh, but it doesn't make that sound in this word or this word. <laughs> it's just, it's a crazy language. And so luckily, my students at AUW really are generally good at English, but it, it's, a, it's a rotten language to have to try to know in order to get a decent job. But that's the way it is. Um, all right, so that, I will talk more about that assignment at the next class. I will post the grid of what I grade on. It's a standard grid for core classes. It was given to me by Dr. Cohn, who's the head of the core. Um, she's my boss. Um, and so I don't wanna take questions today about it, but maybe at the end of class uh, next time. I will, by then I will have written a very specific assignment and posted it. So make sure you read that before you come with questions during class. Another um, point I wanna ask you, and I want you to post on that reactions and give me a thumbs up if the answer is yes. And a, um, uh, 
I don't know if they have thumbs down or just nothing. Now, Dr. Cohn has been looking at the recordings because she has to evaluate us if we're doing a good job. And she herself got into Jungian psychology, deep into it, and she studied it and her dissertation was on Chinese philosophy. I mean, it's really interesting. And she identifies with Hestia. So I, it occurred to me that I could ask her to be a guest lecturer on Wednesday morning, or if she has a class, uh, she could make a little 10 minute YouTube video about how she identifies with Hestia. But I want to take a vote from my students. How many of you, I don't know if you know Dr. Cohn, um, how many of you would like to have her give a 10 minute presentation about how she identifies with Hestia um, next time? Okay, we got, okay. Ah, oh, these things disappear after what, two seconds or something? I didn't know they disappeared. <laughs> okay, anyway, I saw a lot we of- We can raise our hands instead. Raising okay, raise hands your hands longer. Okay, good. Raise your hand then. I guess I'll, I have to find out everything the hard way, don't I? Um. Madeline, Nahida, Untari. Um, if you don't raise your hand, that means you don't, you'd rather not, or um, is there, anyway. Okay, so we've got four, four, eight, nine, 10, 11 pluses, and we've got four no responses. Um, so I think that, that sounds good. <laughs> I will ask Dr. Cohn. It's, it's very amazing. Um, so I just want to let you know, again, this will happen to you, that sometimes in your life, you get in situations and you talk to people and you realize, I don't have anything in common with this, these people. I don't belong here. This is not my place. Um, and that's happened to me a lot when I've been living in Batesville and I, I do sometimes feel like I really have to go. I can't make any positive contribution and I can create a lot of negative synchronous, negative energy. So I get myself out of a lot of situations. But when I came to AUW, I just felt like, oh boy, <laughs> these are my people. Oh uh, my gosh. And they're different kinds of people like uh, Rania and Annika are probably Athena and Artemis. And, um, but Tiffany, oh my gosh, we just, we're like this. We just sort of finish each other's sentences. And so that's been a really nice experience. And I just want to tell you that you will have experiences like that. Sometimes everything falls apart. Sometimes everything comes together and just try to keep going. So, so it, it is kind of interesting that today, the, today's uh, material is about Persephone. And I did explain how my life blew apart and I had terrible nightmares. I couldn't sleep. And when I was reading it, I was, oh my God, I still, I still remember those dreams. They were horrible. Um, I left 25 years ago, and I think it was one year ago, or maybe two years ago, was the last time I dreamed that my daughter was dead. So, you know, 23 years of on and off having this dream that my daughter is dead. Um, but you can't control that, right? That, there's just a part of our psyche that is very instinctual and social constructs either 
uh, allow that to sort of get integrated into the culture or they damage it and make it harder. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we're getting at. Patriarchy does damage, but the um, image of the goddesses from Crete just gives you some idea that you can pull out of it. There's a better way. Women can live healthy lives. Um, and then also in my case, I, I, I want you to know that I don't respect myself as much as I respect my students, that the students in this class have already overcome a lot of things that I didn't have to overcome at that age. I had other things later on, but basically, I, in college, I was pretty much doing what was kind of assumed. Um, and the things I studied, my parents wanted me to be philosophical and not allegiant to any one religion or any one. They wanted me to be uh, ecumenical, interfaith. And um, so that I pretty much was following, even though I thought I was independent. <laughs> when I look back, it wasn't that big a deal. But a lot of my students, especially in Lyon, they're stepping outside of the box. They're thinking for themselves. And then a lot of the AUW students have supported their parents, which is good, um, but not of a whole lot of other people. So. All of you are like independent, Rick, you know, you're creating a new culture for the next generation. Um, so I, even somebody as spoiled as me, even somebody as privileged living in America, white skinned, you know, all that stuff I had, you know, I collapsed. I had some real issues after decades of being told I wasn't <laughs> uh, so that happens. People tell you you're ugly, you're stupid, you're lazy, you're oh, all these things for decades. Um, so I just do want you to fight back. Don't internalize it. Um, when I read these essays about poems about rape and all these essays about uh, the way women are treated, when I was your age, none of this existed. There was nothing to read. And so if you think about it, what would it be like to have gotten raped, but there was no word for it. There wasn't considered wrong. It, you, there's nobody to talk to. There's nothing, there's nothing to read. And that's how women have lived until recently. And that's why I like you to look up stuff. I like you to expose you, let you know that there's a whole lot out there. And it was from age 35, I just started reading everything I could get my hands on, which most of it had been written within 15 years about every aspect of women's lives and experiences. So now I have that in the back of my mind that I can refer to. That's what I want you to have starting out, right? I want you to have that so that you have that to support and then also have other sisters. Um, I also read two books about uh, women from one, the Dancing in the Mosque. Uh, Kajiha sent me the, the um, paper copy um, ebook, and I think it was free, so I think I could forward it to you. I don't know if you know that book, da Dancing in the Mosque. And so I just spend these days when I don't have class, I'll just spend the whole day reading a book so I can get, get my mind into a different world. And then I also read the book um, uh, Nomad by a woman from Somalia. I don't know if you know her, Ali, I think her last name is, um, and she has a foundation, but she just talks about some pretty gruesome stuff. She, her first book was called Infidel, and it was 
it won a lot of awards and she's pretty well known in the US, but I don't know about where you are. Um, if you want to, again, I would like to read um, biographies, memoirs of women from the countries that you're from. So I can get into, I can think about my students and I can think about the stories and the books that they've written that they've read that have influenced them or that are a support in the back of their mind so they know they're not alone in the world. That's, I would love to read some more of those. Um, so I can, uh, I know, so we developed this community, right? Of like-minded women who have, at least have empathy or sympathy. You know, I understand your situation a little better um that would that would be nice so let's start with um everybody doing round one of somebody they know who has or someone in the public eye who has been victimized and has either is still in this victimization frame of mind or they've been able to come out of it and do something positive now, a lot of students have already written about that in the other goddesses. And so when you're writing your, your paper, you'll probably have to sort through all that stuff and figure out. It's not supposed to be cut and dried because everyone goes through, everyone experiences all of these at various times and in various degrees. So it there's no right and wrong answer. That's why all you do is explain to me why you put that person in that category when you're thinking of, because at this time in her life, that happened, right? And so it follows the archetype at that time in her life. So, okay, so Asbina, what, what do you have? Are you there? Okay, I'm gonna keep moving. And Asbina, if if you um, somehow come online again, then you can let me know. Okay, Madeline. I'm wondering if the, okay, if it's not working. Um, Claire, can you unmute yourself and speak? Yeah. Okay, I don't know why the other two can't, but they'll just let me know. Okay, Claire, go ahead. Okay, um, I went with a, sim a kind of a simplified example for mine, just my personal life. Um, a friend of mine that was in, I. I kind of took it as on relationships. She was in a five-year relationship that, as it said, it kind of took her natural disposition and like her natural personality and happiness and spun it around due to situational things. And I think like, I guess, as it says, forced, you know, she was kind of forced underground because of it. But then on the other side of it, I think she's glad that it happened because when she did come back out of the, underground <laughs> you know she came above it was like there was like pure happiness like it was understanding she like learned from it so that's how the spin I put on it and in the quotation you say in the book um the dark set of life is part of my worldview so you're glad it happened you're glad you were forced underground and I think that was something that we all have those situations and that was my example of it okay the thing that reals, really annoys me though is that I've heard so many students say it must be God's will, like God must have wanted to put me through this. And that I just think is terrible. <laughs> I don't think it's a meanie like that. I think the causes are human. Yeah. And so, and again, I'm not sure some of the other students, I would be really careful about deciding there's a male God who will make women suffer so that they understand something. 
Does that make sense, Claire? Yes. Yeah, there are a lot in a lot of my students over the years. Um, Nahida, go ahead. Nahida? Professor, I didn't find anyone yet. Uh, if I find you, then I'll let you know. Okay. Okay, Untari, are you there? Okay, she might not be. She wrote me a note. Uh, Louis. Uh, yes, Professor. Yeah. Um, I have example of a woman and of a woman in public eyes. Uh, her name is uh, Mazari. She's a Pakistan uh, artist and activist. Um, her, uh, she grew up in a very conservative family where good daughter never say no to their parent. And uh, when she was 18 years old, her father told her that I want you to get married. And she, like at a daughter, told her father that if, if that make you happy, then I will say yes. Then like she become a wife, do whatever her husband want her to do, uh, want her do. Uh, she didn't feel it were a happy marriage. And two years later, she had a car accident. Like her husband fell asleep while he was driving the car. He he managed to jump out to save himself, but she stuck inside the car got serious injured, injured and have to move to a wheelchair for the rest of her life. Um, then like everything come worse to her when her husband divorced her because her disability and inability to giving birth after the accident. And the, 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 the worst thing is uh, her father do, her father let her suffer in herself with her mother and father and didn't care about her at all. Um, she spent two, two years in the hospital, but wishing a more difficult time in her life, and she felt completely hopeless. But the moment in which uh, she first sat in the wheelchair, she told herself that she cannot, she cannot sit, like, sorry, I'm sorry, like she cannot just sit and wait for the miracle, wait for someone come to save her life as she used to be. So on the pain she went through during the time she was in the hospital, encouraged her to continue pursuing her dream as an artist. So uh, now she know that one of the best painter and actors in Pakistan. Um, I think I think her at an example of a Persephone because um, this accident in the turning point of her life somehow transformed her life from a nameless maiden instead of when she was young, uncertain, wait for someone to save her life. But this accident made her become the queen on her in her own life. Yeah, this is my example. Very good. Good. Um, so I think a lot of you have written about women and last year they did too, that had been raped or all these awful things, they eventually start a nonprofit and start giving back, right? And that's good. It's not God's will. It's determination and support from other people who want to make the world a better place. But, um, um, oh, I can't remember what I was gonna say. Oh yeah, think of the first woman who decided she was gonna expose the rape and, and start the organization. Think about how much courage it took for those first women to break through all this silence and then start these NGOs, right? Somebody had to do it and now there's enough of them. So I think women can, uh, there are enough women in the public eye or Facebook or influencers or whatever, so that if even a pretty isolated woman gets raped or abused or something, she knows she can get out and, sh and she becomes motivated because I want to start an organization or I want to contribute to that. So I think, 
I'm hoping that that just becomes a part of the cultural norm that guys don't get away with it and that it gets public and also women start fighting back to prevent it or you can recover from it. It'll never, we're not gonna let you, you know, stay a victim forever. So I, does everybody understand that? How much courage it must have taken at the beginning to carve out that space? Anyway, I hope so. Um, what about Al? We have one guy in this class. Did you have anything to say, Al? Uh, I picked like a historical figure. Um, okay. And then I picked Mariana Grajales and she's a, she's a figure in Cuban history. And um, she was kind of born into like an impoverished class to, a, to like a mixed race family. Uh, and this was in the 1850s. Uh, well, I'm sorry, 1800s, early 1800s that she was born. Um, and then she ends up personally serving uh, in, the, um, in the war for independence in the 1850s. Uh, and again, in, 18, in 1895, uh, she ends up running uh, field hospitals in, the, in another independence war that takes place in Cuba. And then I, uh, I was reminded of the Lost Goddesses reading that you've uploaded before, where Persephone takes on this role of uh, guiding uh, people into the afterlife and uh, has this, uh, this duty that she fulfills. You know, it's not so much that she's been a uh, she's been uh, forced into something. It's a duty she willingly fulfills. And uh, her, there's accounts of her herself personally going into battlefields, drag her, her sons out of, the, out of battle when they're injured, the soldiers out of battle when they're injured. And she kind of filled that role of uh, protecting people when they're hurt, uh, being that person as someone passes on into the next life. And, um, you know, it's it's less of a personal victimization and more of like a class victimization because she's from uh, a mixed race family and uh, part of the war for independence was to gain equality for people of all colors in Cuba. Um, so I, I just saw parallels between her and uh, and Persephone. Good. So um, actually, Al was in the class like Liz and Sam, where we did do at least we did the the art part of these goddesses. And so um, he's seen some of it already, but another reason he liked studying that is I think because he is Cuban American and, and he has experienced some of the oppression uh, that comes from race and class in the US. Um, so anyway, uh, Kajia. Thank you for giving me that book. I loved it. Yes, Professor, you're welcome. Uh, I want to say about uh, uh, the author of this book, Myra, Dancing the Must. Okay. Yes, uh, I think she is like Persephone, she had the, she was not uh, a very independent and very, strong girl but uh, when she got married and uh, she become like uh, she had uh, faced a lot of problem in her personal life and um, she uh, uh, that marriage could uh, uh, like it was a lesson for her to become more stronger and uh, independent woman and uh, because when uh, she got divorced and uh, uh, her husband uh, said for her that you cannot see the child, the, her son. And uh, that's why she wanted to write the dancing uh, in the mosque, that book, to raise uh, her voice and to uh, just uh, like, uh, just say that, no, I want to be a, a woman that uh, that is active and not just a woman, just like a defeat woman. I want to become independent and that divorce changed her life. I think it was like related to Persephone. I thought ever since she was young, she was one of those uh, stubborn, 
and kind of Artemis types don't, I mean, wasn't she, she taught school to those kids, right? Um, you know, I read these two books back to back, so now I'm losing track, but um, she was oppressed a lot and um, she got out of it. So she, yeah, she wrote the book to help other people, right? To get a culture, people can identify with this and she got out and you can get out. And also how awful it is for women to try and juggle wife, mother and career. It's just, it's just so impossible, right? And men never worry about that. And women, it's almost unattainable. So the double standard there is really serious problem. Um, Jareen, have you got something? Can you? Okay, so I chose a friend of mine. Um, she was, uh, she had a joyful personality, had a touch of innocence. She was open-minded, enthusiastic about sports, and she always stood for herself. So. Um, once she was in a public transport and was sitting next to a guy, he was a pervert and he was kind of harassing her, I mean, hitting her with, hitting her chest with his elbow over and over again. And after a minute of tolerating, Zaida, uh, I mean, my friend um, stood up and screamed at him in front of everyone. Later, he got kicked out from the public transport. So she always stood for herself and for us as well and she always did what she felt right so i think she is an example of persephone archetype well i mean i hope that the guy doesn't find out where she lives right and come oh, after he doesn't her. i mean stuff like that can happen right jereen and yeah. sometimes that's women shut up because they don't want him following her home they don't want him finding out who she is um, so I'm glad she did it, but I'm also glad she seemed there to are a few, I mean, there are a number of cases on acid attacks because women stood up for themselves. Yeah. And rape as well. Yeah. But she was very brave enough to do that. Okay, good. Um, it's kind of a judgment call and some of it is kind of luck, but I mean, it has to, people do have to stand up. It's just there's going to be blowback. It's going to be, it's not going to be easy. Okay, May, what do you have? Um, okay, Professor, I want to bring the example of one of uh, my current closest friends. Like she used to be sexually abused and raped by many different men, um, even when she was like underage. And um, like that, that experience like led to her like unstable mental issues and also her obsession with um, sex like which is very unhealthy and um, now she she has not really like recovered from it but um, according to her, sto her story I can see like many big issue with people's response to sex and also women suffering for example like um, in my country, Vietnam, like sex is still a taboo um, topic. And also when women um, get raped, many people still like blame it for women, like because of the way she dressed or like she, the way she behaved or something like that, rather than trying to understand her pain, um, which is a big problem. And also due to that, my friend couldn't like confide in anyone, even like her parents. That's why her pain get bigger and bigger, and it's really hard to really like recover from it. Um, but anyway, I can see like her strength, and that's why I I am still here like constant constantly telling her like how strong she is. Like um, even when she was through a lot of like difficult things, and I believe that like if she got like mental support from people properly, maybe from me and some of my friends, like later on, she can like gradually recover even when it's a slow progress. But I, I think that if she recovers, she can do a lot of like things and she can like inspire other women. But I think it's really hard for her, 
like to like suffer from like many like sexual like like many bad sexual harassment from men kind of like that yep two of the women uh, that i know have been abused i don't I, you know they talk about they used to talk about sex all the time and it's sad right it gets to be this fixation um it's just a preoccupation so it's hard it's it's arrested development it's hard for them to develop beyond this pain that they have so yeah it's good to have friends though it's good for her not to know she's alone because that just prevents you from if you can't go forward you're going to go backward i mean our minds and our lives never stay in the same place so helping someone go forward is good because otherwise she'll go backwards. Um, okay, Poppy, what you got? Yeah, Professor, after reading this article, I have one example uh, from my neighborhood sister. And she she grew up in a middle class family and her father always uh, forced to go, uh, got married. And then uh, she got married, and then uh, that day her husband is died it, died it, and then now she uh, she is doing a, a government job, and she did not want to get married, and uh, and in our religious it's not allowed to after uh, died husband uh, she cannot uh, uh, go. <clears throat> she she cannot live with another boy, so now. Uh, she is, you know, uh, she she cannot get any um, child also. Now she is doing a job. Yeah, I think this. She can't remarry or she doesn't want to? She can also and she does, doesn't also. So both of them. Okay. Okay. Um, Lakin. So the, the person I thought of is my friend who graduated from here last year, but um, she was, or she's very kind and like sort of, um, well, like, yeah, she's shy, but almost like an uncomfortable degree, like, I guess, anxious, like she was afraid to talk up in class and things like that. So like, um, she was very kind, but people like would be able to walk over her and like her parents um, had like this weird control over her. Like they would tell her where she was allowed to live and not live. And they took out a bunch of credit cards in her name. And like, yeah, I don't know like what the point of that was. But anyway, her credit score is just so messed up now. But Yes, she is who I thought about and she's doing better now. She is um, on the way to become a, becoming a midwife. So that's oh. me. Mm -hmm. Well, I know after teaching at Lyon, there are a lot of Lyon students who have gotten raped or abused or um, on campus. And our campus doesn't have nearly as much uh, of that kind of culture as a lot of other college campuses. So it's just uh, really sad how often this stuff happens. Um, all right, Rossi, do you have something? Hi, Professor, I do. Um, I felt like I used to talk about Somali mom before, so I decided to go with a best friend of mine who I thought she is like Persephone, although she has never been raped or abducted, but she has been raped mentally. And I feel like she has been victimized by um, society's norms and expectations of her. So um, she, so she goes to the same high school as me. And then when she was in her junior year, um, she faced an incident where there was a group of guys from the school who were um, 
because she has like a birthmark on her face. So the guy was trying to um, like call her names and saying that she's not beautiful, this and that, and that has caused her to be in um, severe pain. And she hasn't come out, out of that incident yet. Every single time she talks to me, she always mention about that incident to me. And I feel like the abuse that she has faced and the bully has caused her to go like into the underworld and she's not able to escape that pain yet. Okay, good. Actually, um, Lake, and I didn't mean to misinterpret, actually, it wasn't about rape. It was about that kind of psychological abuse, more like what Rossi said. Um, I feel like it's very relevant, though. Okay. I mean, it just doesn't have to be. Yeah. It can be all this psychological manipulation, and, all, and that is something people deny, right? And in a way that they can deny it a lot more socially acceptable to deny it than than flat out rape these days right mm -hmm. but it's but it does it cripples people in their ability to flourish their whole life it, it arrests their development right does that make sense Lakin? yeah and it, it changes the way that they interact with people in the world right. it, yeah it leaves a mark on them forever Hopefully, you know, not forever, but it takes work to get out of it. Um, Newsrot, what have you got? Do you have something? Are you there? Okay, Margia, do you have something? Okay, Rupia? Do you have something? Uh, Fahima? Hi, Professor. I couldn't read it. I couldn't read the post before the class. I'm really sorry. Okay, because of your internet? Yeah, and Professor, I'm sending you my uh, weekly post uh, just before the class, please. Till that, till I'm not, I have not sent you all my weekly post. Please do not consider my grade still. Please give not, me time. No, I know, I know that lots of you have obstacles, so I, I don't, I don't plan on grading anybody lower. Um, if you're being lazy, just tell me and I'll grade you lower, okay? Otherwise, I'm just going to trust you. <laughs> um, no, no, please. No, I, I'm just making a joke, right? Please trust um, me, I'm doing great. I do trust you. Um, Kajia, do you have something? Uh, let's start up here with Asbina again. Asbina, can you get on on line yet? Uh, oh, okay. She says she will be listening. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, so Asbina gave me her reason. I'm just, it's very hard for me to, <laughs> to do the chat and the talk. I, I wasn't wired this way. Um, so let's see, Madeline, can you get on now? Are you there? Madeline wrote something in the chat box, oh, Professor. Okay, what did she write? Um, oh, is this hers? Uh, no, that's Aspina. Okay, Aspina wants to talk about an actress named uh, Shweta Khad, Khad, uh, um, Khadga, a Nepal, she's from Nepal, struggling actress. She entered the film industry. Her first film became a blockbuster with Krishna Sharista. She rose to stardom. 
she got married with uh, her co-actor, Krishna. When they got married, people called her a gold digger. She's trying to establish herself as a well-known actress in the industry. Her husband was a popular actor. When they went for a honeymoon, her husband died due to pneumonia. After he died, people called her an unlucky bitch that she ate up her husband. She's a witch. She told that she was jealous for her husband's career and the money he had. She was neglected by society, even went on a hiatus due to the criticisms she was getting, even though she didn't do anything. Oh my goodness. How many of you raise your, I mean, raise your hand. How many of you have heard about her story? That's crazy. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That is crazy. Okay, so who else has been writing to me here? Madeline? Is this Madeline? Okay, she's having technical. A woman she chose was Selena Gomez. First appeared on Barney, then on Disney. She always had to appear perfect and have a good reputation. She had to conform to an image of what was expected of her because she was in the public eye. She started dating Justin Bur Bieber. They had an off again, on again relationship when they broke up, the media humiliated her. She wrote songs about it. Uh, from her side of the story, the media didn't seem to care. They thought she was just another singer writing a breakup song. She decided she was gonna change herself for the good. She started creating new music. She started a makeup brand. She now seems happier. Okay. And she keeps her personal life private. <laughs> Okay, so the main thing here that I want the rest of you, just do not diss other women, okay? Uh, this way that people talk about other people behind their back. Please don't do that. Um, it, it shows a lack of confidence and it undermines your own confidence. What are people saying about me? It undermines other women's confidence. So. Not only don't do that, but do things where you support each other, where you admire each other. I mean, when I tell you I admire you, I respect you more than myself, I'm not making that up. But I do keep saying it to keep reminding you that you are amazing and you need to believe in yourself and you need to know that all of you have got a habit of overcoming obstacles that most guys are, don't even know that they don't have to overcome. So just keep reminding yourself of that, that, that you've, you know, you're not in the same spot as this other guy, you know, even though the world might say you're in the same spot, you're not, because you've had to work a lot harder to get there. If it isn't just taking the same test in school, it's the psychological work that you've had to do. And you're more vulnerable. To, to, you know, lose that kind of confidence and lose that stuff. So you have to keep reinforcing it and keep bonding with other women and supporting each other because they've got so much psychological support in the back of their heads um, that's built into the collective unconscious. When they read books, when they read history, when they look at the news, there's guys everywhere who are, have achieved things that they're trying to be like, where women are just carving something out, carving. And then they see women in the public eye who diss other women or who buy into men's culture. And, you know, it's way, way harder. Um, so just keep working on, on saying, you know, we're gonna create a new situation by the time, right? By the time you're my age, It'll be substantially different. Um, are we ready for round two? So I'm going to start round two, but then I'm going to, if you didn't get a chance on round one, uh, you can say two things. So Nahida, do you have a work of art? Okay, so I, again, I think she might be disconnected. Um, 
Okay. All right. So Rupia can't participate. Um, yeah, Aspina. All right. So, so every time something happens like this, I want you to think, don't think about, oh my, you know, the class is falling apart. Think about, this is just an indication of how many obstacles the women, the students are overcoming. And so when it happens, I want you to be inspired by it, not to be frustrated by it, okay? That's how I feel and that's how we all should feel. Um, that we can learn all the material and then the things like this uh, just means that the students are living what we're reading about, right? They're literally living this stuff, which is a lot more meaningful <laughs> than just reading about it. Um, okay, Louis, do you have some, oh, Untari, do you have anything? Are you connected? Yes, Professor. Okay, you can do two if you want then. Yes, like um, I use a movie Tangled as my example of work of arts related with Persephone. I'm sorry, Professor, can you hear me? Uh, say it again. It's just that when you say these names from people of another country because they don't know the name, then oh, it's it's a movie Tangled. Uh, let me check in the chat box. Okay. It's it's a Disney movie. Oh. <laughs> What's the name of it? Uh, I wrote it in the chat box. Tangled? Yeah, it's a Disney movie. Oh, okay, I never heard of it. So that's, okay, Tangled, okay. Yeah, in my opinion, Rapunzel in this film is like describing Persephone who is trapped in the power of her mother, Demeter. Uh, Rapunzel who does not have freedom but has the desire to be free and does what she thinks is right. Moreover, Rapunzel seemingly innocent, but strong and considerate person shown by how obedient and kind she is with her mother. And that's why I think this movie is related with a certain type of woman. Now, is the mom portrayed as the dark Demeter? Yes. <laughs> okay. She trapped her in the castle alone for a long time. Okay. I mean, that's interesting though, right? I mean, again, you're trying to help girls who do get in that problem uh, to get out of that problem. But on the other hand, now you're criticizing a whole bunch more women in the process. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. It's, it's so complicated, but that's... Yeah. It, Thing. And I will, I will try to look at that because my granddaughter, I only have one granddaughter, she likes Disney and she has all these Disney pr princess costumes. And, um, but that's all right. Her mother is a really strong woman, moved from Mexico, made a whole new life for herself. She's, you know, she really is creating a life. She has great friends. She loves my son. Uh, so she's a strong woman. But I do worry that she's getting crippled just by these fantasies and all that. Uh, why, you know, she's making some mistakes and then she'll have to make up for them. Uh, but anyway, so uh, I will, I'll try to find a movie I can watch with her that I, I don't end up in the middle of. Ah! <laughs> right, I, get me out of here. I don't want her to watch this, you know. Um, so, so, but thanks. Anything else you want to say, Untari? Yes, Professor. There's a poem by Kathleen Norris. It's um, from the document that you sent to us, the Persephone quotes. Okay. Uh, it's about her own inner Persephone and to tell a little girl in charge. Yeah. It has caught my eye and like, it's depicted how her bright world turned into darkness and how she herself starts to love darkness itself. Also, how was her mother who loved her is the one who hurt her? Even so, I don't understand what it's mean by in part heads gave up on Persephone because I never heard that before. 
but the poem actually describes how Persephone life is. Uh, when I reread these, I really, I don't know how many of you went, wow, that's another layer of victimization I didn't know about. Did any of you, if you want to raise your hand, did any of you think, wow, here's some more stuff? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that. Also, in that, in that Persephone quotes, there's a lot of story about rap. Yeah, Mostly about sexual ab abuse and rapes. And it was the dads that are alcoholics. And yeah. dads that abuse their daughters and the daughters are so in love with them, they believe it. And then there was the, the woman who got told she was mentally ill and she was on lithium, right? Yes. There's just layers and layers of stuff that I was thinking my students you know, at AUW, even in this very high tech um, American society, they just have used their technology to create more ways of victimizing women. Yes. <laughs> I mean, how many of you, again, if you want to raise your hand, how many of you that you thought about that? My God, I thought it was just poverty that led to this stuff. But no, oh, you can be a really rich country and, and end up victimizing women in a six more ways. <laughs> Did you think that, Untari? Yeah, like right now there's a lot of sexual harassment even from the internet, it's like from Facebook, Twitter. It's a technology for us to connect with everyone, but it's used as a sexual harassment for women too. But I mean, using lithium, right? Using drugs for mental illness. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, <laughs> anyway, I, I, I do want you to read this so you know all these ways that these things happen. Um, and you can, you know, be prepared and not let yourself, don't let someone tell you that you're the one who's mentally ill, right? Yes. That was one thing I drew the line on. I do think I could have gone to somebody and got diagnosed, right? If I told them my dreams and all that. But I, I you know, one thing I'm not going to do after I get treated like shit is let myself get diagnosed, right? Because that's another layer of, of uh, black mark. And you have to live with that. You might have to tell somebody that when you're applying for a job. So don't, if the cause is patriarchy, don't let's, you know, don't label yourself as, you know, mentally ill. It's not your problem. It's the society's problem. Get some friends. <laughs> Just find some friends. <laughs> okay. Um, Louis, do you have something? Uh, yes, professor. Um, uh, speaking of the artwork, I have an example of painting of Mazari, the, the, the Pakistan artist that I talked about in the first round. Um, she had a collection of painting depict the story of her life. Um, it's, it's, a paint, it's a painting depict a particular state of her life, like from she was dying. Uh, get married, make car accident, then a difficult time when she dwell in her pain, and how she turning these difficult difficulties into strength to live the rest of her life in the way she want. Um, this exhibition is the uh, inspiration, aspiration for other women who is struggle at some point of her life, and I think it's courage them not to giving up. Uh, not to give it up and find a way that she, uh, they want to love and pursue their dream. So I think this is a very kind of um, encouraged work, work art, artwork, sorry, yeah. So that's so the thing about women in developing countries. Um, you don't have to wait for the legal system to change. I think the arts, especially now with the internet, like you have access to the arts. And that can that gets you in a different mental state and gets you inspired, motivated, and eventually you'll be able to you know 
change the laws or change these much bigger institutional structures. But again, it can start with the arts. And because of the internet, you don't have to have a lot of money to have access of um, listening to it, even contributing to it, being inspired by it. So that's a good thing. What about you, Al? Okay. What, a, what about you, Jereen? Do you have something? No, I'll go. Okay. May? Uh, okay, so I want to tell people about a talk on TEDx stage. Like I will send the link um, on the chat box later, but um, it's a talk between a man and a woman on the stage. Like um, the man used to be the rapist and the woman used to be the victim. And, you know, it's very rare because a rapist and a victim can talk to each other later and even like, inspire each other on like a very big stage like TED. So um, actually the talk is about like the journey of healing of the woman, like after being raped and like being haunted by um, the, the past pain. Like she talked that like, um, actually the rapist used to be um, her boyfriend when, he, when she was uh, very young. And at that time, he was like drunk and he couldn't really control himself. And also um, about her, about, about the girl, like she was so small to, to, to be aware that like um, he was raping her. Like because she thought it's, uh, my boyfriend is not a stranger. So maybe it's just like having sex. It's not about raping. But like later on, she realized that um, any sexual like um, behavior without her consent is raped. And she was like um, obsessed by the pain for a long time until like even when she got married, she couldn't really like erase the pain. And she decided to contact um, her ex-boyfriend and her boyfriend luckily is also aware of her pain. And they kind of like um, got uh, like got some talk again and also like gradually healed uh, her pain from inside. So um, it's, it's a long talk though, but I think that it made me like realize a lot of things about rape and also about the journey of healing. I know that it's not as simple as just saying like um, trying to move on, trying to recover. It's not easy like that. Even when I, um, I never really like um, get that experience, but I can see many people suffering from that. And that's why when I'm seeing this talk, I see that it's a message for many women like to learn how to heal. Like they should like um, kind of like face the pain, talk to herself and also to, even when it's really painful, but if we try to avoid it, like try to avoid talking about the old pain and like the bad stuff, maybe we cannot really like recover from it. So it's really tough to face, but um, you know, I think it's worth like dealing with it kind of like that. Okay, so I, you do need to know that 85% of rapes are like that. Somebody that she knew, uh, a former husband, uh, ex-husband, a boyfriend, an ex-boyfriend. Lots of times they're both drunk or one is drunk, just like that. It's not the stranger in the street. It's, it's somebody you know who you might've loved at one point. Um, and, and it's traumatic because you did trust the person and you did know them. And so that makes it even more traumatic because your defenses are down. Um, but anyway, if you put it on the chat box, I'll try to figure out how to download it and put it on the YouTube channel, okay? Yes, I agree. Okay. Um, all right, so Poppy, do you have something? Okay, I, I think I want to break you down into breakout groups. And so some of you haven't been able to speak yet, but just do it in your breakout group because um, I do want everyone to get a chance to be in a smaller group, unless you don't want to. So how many of you would like me to do a breakout group at this point? 
Otherwise, there won't be any time for it. All right. How many of you would prefer to be in the big group? I only got one reaction so far. Um, oh, prefer the big group? OK, I've got five hands up. Um, Oh, uh, six. Okay, if you prefer the big group, uh, we can do that. Where did we leave off? Um, Poppy, are you there? Uh, okay, Lakin, do you have something? Yeah, I kind of thought of somebody from a TV show, if, that, if that's okay. Um, so it's Downton Abbey, a girl named Anna, and she's the lady's maid. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay, okay. What was the TV show again, though? Downton Abbey. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, and so Anna is the lady's maid of a lady, and she's very loyal, and, like, she helps move a body for the lady. And um, later on, she is sexually assaulted, but um, then she um, she ends up getting married, and you can tell like she's really blossoming into herself, and she ends up like blackmailing somebody for the lady. So, yeah, that's what I thought of. Okay, um, Jereen, your hand is up. Is that just left over from before? No, I prefer to stay in the big group. So I voted for it. You prefer what, Doreen? I prefer to stay in the big group. Oh, OK. Um, Rossi, was it your turn? Um, yes, I can share. Um, so I have a code of conduct by Cambodians. And it's called Babsray. I'm going to read an excerpt from it. Don't bring the outside flame into the house and then burn it. Your skirt must not rustle while you walk. You must be patient and eat only after the men in your family have finished. You must serve and respect your husband at all times and above all else. You can't touch your husband's head without first bowing in respect. School is more useful for boys than girls. Be, respect, be respectful towards your husband, serving him well and keep the flame of the relationship alive. Otherwise, it will burn you. Do not bring external problems into the home. Do not take internal problems out of the home. So Chibab Sarai plays a really major role in describing how women should behave towards their husband over the generations, and especially in the rural parts of Cambodia, where I come from, a lot of the girls' future have been crippled because um, their mothers will always teach them how to behave and how to respect their husbands. And their place is, the, uh, is inside the house doing household chores. And because of this um, code of conduct and mentality, um, they are refrained from sh sharing internal household problems to the outside world. So a lot of them are victimized because it becomes very challenging for them to report cases of domestic and sexual violence and spousal rape, which as May mentioned earlier, is very common in Cambodia, but it is an alien topic because not a lot of people understand what it is. So they're usually raped by their partners and silenced by the cultural norms because they're not given a platform to talk and um, the code of conduct doesn't give them a chance to share their feelings. Okay, so... Um... I, what I would like all of you to do is if you know of a code of conduct in your society or else in your religion, if you would put that on your Persephone post 
And then you could uh, talk a little bit about what percentage of the women in your country do you think actually still follow it? Um, that would be really interesting to me. And I think it would be interesting to the other students too. I know there's the code of Manu in Hinduism. I don't know how many uh, Hindus actually follow it. You know, I, and I would rather have the opinion of somebody from that country. I know that a lot of you have gotten out of, you know, you're different. So, you know, you're, you're the exception, but you might also know about what percentage of women uh, just never get out of it, right? I know when I left home after high school, out of 350 students, I don't know, maybe 50 of them got out of town or out of the state. And I mean, I'm all over the world. <laughs> uh, so I know most of them ended up getting married, having kids. It's sad because politically it's bad because countries really need to adapt to change. They always do. They especially do right now in this point in history, we need to go sustainable. We need to have some real changes and this code of conduct, all this stuff makes people conservative and they don't want change. And it's becoming more and more maladaptive and culture is getting more and more out of touch with nature and becoming more and more like a disease. Uh, and we get more diseases for that reason. So it's not really helping anybody, but um, it does lead, it has a major factor, I'm sure, in the fact that people don't wanna change. So it would be interesting to me if you know of those things. We don't need to talk about it now, but that would be really nice to get a collection of all these codes of conduct from the different countries or from the different religions, and then your perception about how influential they are. Okay, so News Rot, do you have anything? Okay, Claire, do you have something? I had a painting that I found online, which I'll put in my post, but it had a caption with it that I liked um, that I'll read. It said, she is both queen of the underworld as wife of Hades and associated with the new life that rises with the spring, death and life are no longer mutually exclusive, but coexist in both the upper and lower worlds. There's life and death and death and life. And I just liked how it, the last sentence really, that there is life and death and death and life, that, you know, it, they're not exclusive one or the other, that it's, it's combined, everything is like that, but especially in that situation. Well, one thing you can do is, and I've done this, um, just think, you know, I'm going to be 30 anyway, I'm going to be 40, I'm going to die what do I want to have done, right, before it's over? Yeah. And so when I, writing books, at least for me, writing books was really, 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 really hard. And I have to put myself in a mindset that I don't want to go in. My body doesn't want to introvert. And every time I was just thinking, I don't want to go there, I would say, do you want to have written this book? Yes. Well, <laughs> right now you got to sit down and write it so the idea that there you know time is short that what do you want to do this year as a 20 year old as a 21 year old right what what are your goals what is it possible for you to do um just always be asking that and that would be to me the death in life does that make sense yes plus after you're 21, when you're 22, 21 is dead to you, right? And so every, you know, just this sense, you don't have to drive yourself absolutely crazy, but just remember life doesn't go on forever. Uh, and eventually, you know, you do time, what do you want to do with your time at each point in your life? Um, okay, so Margia, do you have something? Okay, uh, let's see. 
Is there anybody else who is capable of speaking like their electricity works and they want to speak? Uh, please speak up now. We have 10, 12 more minutes. And if there isn't that I can always talk, obviously I'm a talker. So I'll wait for a minute to see any other comments. Does anyone want to comment on other people's comments, which is what I like you to do in the small groups? Is there anything that struck you about, in general, what the other students said? Is there anything surprising? What sort of insights does somebody want to share? Okay, so I, what I will say is when I was rereading the Persephone, first of all, it reminded me of those days, oh my gosh, when I could hardly put one foot in front of the other. And so I just wanted to tell my students that you will probably have times in your life like that when it really is hard. I remember staring at my feet to get one to go in front of the other. Um, but you do it, right? And you do it because your body does it. And then, you know, if your body is functioning, even though your mind isn't there yet, it will catch up. You just have to keep going. Um, I became very forgetful. I couldn't, I would set down a piece of paper. I mean, it was really, I, I self-sabotaged a lot. I have actually self-sabotaged myself until COVID. And during this COVID era, I've changed. I was trying to save the world and that was on my agenda. And after COVID, I can't. So now my goal is to help the younger generations as much as I can, because my generation has given you a pile of shit and I'm, I can't argue with those people anymore. I've got to just help the the younger people that now are having to pick up the pieces. And so that's my new goal. I'm not writing another article, another book in my head and you know, yelling at people to say, you're wrong, you're wrong. They, they don't listen. So, so COVID's been good for me. I don't sabotage myself. I just try to help, help people that have to pick up from there. Um, and then I, I mean, the AUW, the people who started it, people like Dr. Cohn, all these people are on the same page as me. They're trying, they want to help, help. So I'm, you know, with uh, sisters, I'm with people with the same mission. Um, so I have really changed a lot since this time. I just, it's important for you to know, we have our ups and downs. Um, I, my personality wasn't like Persephone at all. And yet I became a victim. Uh, the world did that to me. And now I've, I'm, I'm out of it, you know? I do have every once in a while, I'll have a panic attack or I'll, I'll be afraid of something. When it comes to money, you know, all these scams where people say, oh, you know, you're gonna, lose money you got to give me money because somebody's after you whatever it's <laughs> I have to be careful about that because I did in my own way again most of you have to worry a lot more about money but it was always trying to figure out how to pay the bills uh, for the next month so I, I have my buttons and I have to be careful but in general I have stopped sabotaging myself so be careful about that because you can do that. Then all these ways, like the first page had seven different uh, definitions of how to objectify uh, anyone. And I, I think they're really nice distinctions. It just gives you this sense of how complicated this is and how multidimensional it is. Um, then there's the, the phase of Women are silenced and now they're becoming articulate. And I, again, I think especially in developing countries that that really is true, right? You are, we are talking about things 
that your mothers, your grandmothers were silenced, right? So truly, generationally, you are coming, you are in phase two, that the state of articulation as opposed to the state of just suffering and silence. Um, oh my gosh, that story about the guy, the fiance who burned all of his fiance's love letters to other men. Oh my God, did you read that? Oh my God, how abusive is that? And then, you know, Susan Griffin's story of her abusive mother who would get drunk and start, oh my gosh, that's just awful. <laughs> and child abuse and how the children embrace. And oh my gosh, the other thing is I don't drink by choice, but I don't drink because of all the harm it does. So many people suffer so much from alcohol that I, that's why I abstain. It's not because the Quran says, it's not because, it's not for religion reason, it's because it hurts people. It's for a humanitarian and a political reason. Um, so many political, we're just unable to socially evolve because alcohol is constantly creating, you know, leading to rape, leading to all these horrible behaviors. Uh, most people can't control their liquor. In general, it's just a horrible disease. Um, let's see. The, so, I mean, there, there were no rape poems when I was growing up. I remember the first time I read a rape poem, it was just, wow. <laughs> but it's important. It's important that you read, read them and read a lot of them. And just that's part of your way of looking at reality. This is part of reality. And we can't change it if we don't know that it's there, it's serious, it happens all the time. Um, let's see, the, oh yeah, in our country about the, uh, the way slave owners would go have sex with their slaves to create more property and then they'd go sell the kids. <laughs> yeah, that, oh my God. I don't know what you all have in your countries, but slavery is just a, very dark side of our country and it's kept us down the the culture in the south because of slavery is just really in a different place and um it's just a terrible social problem um let's see little girls in church um the day that the the poem about the day that her girl got lost for an hour as a mom, I remember if, if my kid would have been lost for an hour, I mean, I remember not being able to know where my kid was like for 10 minutes and when they're little and it's just a uh, freak out. Um, then that thing about adolescent, when adolescent girls lose all their confidence, the thing about pornography. Um, so I've read a couple books by Andrea Dworkin about that. Um, let's see. The lithium. Juggling the family and career is just a horrible problem and you end up, you know, just ruining your self-confidence. Um, you're a lot more vulnerable to people telling you you're inadequate you become victimized psychologically, right? All right, so so that was my main thing there is that there's just so many layers and layers of this stuff. And um, women send their children off to war and try to believe that that's a good thing. It's just, ugh. Okay, so for next time, we're doing Hestia. She's the contemplative one. And it was amazing to me last year because in general, there aren't very many women like this. This is what I'm like. That's why during my whole life experiences, when I had a little time after I got tenure, I started reflecting on it, right? And then I could see these patterns. And that's why I wrote the book. It wasn't about me. My experiences were not about me. They're just built into the human condition. They're built into patriarchy. And so that all the wisdom literature 
had that same insight. Oh my God, these are patterns. And so I'm just sort of passing that on, right? The people who wrote the myths knew that and I'm the mediator, right? I figured that out and now I pass that on to you, um, these insights so that you can try to learn uh, from the wisdom of the past. It does seem to me that, that we can understand that these patterns do exist everywhere in the world, that they've always existed. This is something that doesn't change over time, but then there's the fact that things really do change over time. So you really are creating a new layer of culture and there's going to be a higher level of culture in your country. So it always existed potentially, women had the potential to do all those things but they never were actually given the opportunity. So you're not carving out something that's made up. Uh, it might seem like it's absolutely new, but it was always there. It's just that it was frustrated. Um, so Hestia, will I'll try to ask Dr. Cohn if she'll do a presentation. Um, I was surprised last year because a lot of my students last year did identify with Hestia. And so I'll be curious to see how many this year, but just because I'm, I'm that way doesn't mean, you know, I, most, most people are extroverts. Most people are, um, they aren't like me. <laughs> and that's a good thing. That's why I thought I could write the book because when I compare it to myself, my readers are going to go, no, I'm not like her. I'm something else. And so they don't, I'm not at all telling somebody about themselves. Um, so I'll, I'll, you know, I'm all up for this. I'm curious to see what you come up with, the examples and the artwork, and that'll be great. Do you have anybody have any other questions? Because it's 940, it's time for you to go to your other classes, whatever. Um, I will have office hours at the usual time, but sometimes I actually forget. But I usually do um, check my emails. If you really want to get a hold of me, martha.beck at lyon, L Y O N, dot edu, because I'm mostly on that email. Uh, on that uh, Gmail account. And I do try to check the other ones, but if you really want to make sure that I've checked it recently, do my Lion account. Um, and then I will write down, you know, that I have office hours, but sometimes if I don't write it down and if I don't, the, oh, there is a big conference this week. So um, I guess I'll, you'll have to request for me to come on to have a conference because it's a huge thing, lots and lots of presentations and I like to find out what people are doing. So just email me if you want a conference and a conference time and I don't have any trouble. You're my priority, right? So, okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, Professor. Bye -bye, Take professor. Care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Of course. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Ah, turn off the recording. <laughs> Call. How to do that? I can't push it over.